Where am I? Joffrey, raise the gate. Nope. Not gonna happen, not me. I had nothing to do with this. This is not my monster. You guys take care of it. I'm out. Shoot her. Shoot her. Run. Like, what is happening here? I, I thought I was going to the Ogilvy Good Zoo. What's happening, everybody? Man, it's so good to see you today. So glad that you are with us here for week one of At The Movies. Hey, my name is Tim, along with my wife, Linda. We're the lead pastors here and just wanted to welcome you. And I know that some of you, maybe you're new and you're going, well, wait a minute. Am I in a church or am I in a movie theater? And the answer is yes. Uh, for the next few weeks, you're actually going to be in both. And we've had people ask us, and maybe you've wondered, like, why does this church do all of these things? I thought church was a place that you just kind of rolled in, that you would sit down, um, you would stand up, maybe sit down and stand up and uh, listen to a message that was maybe very confusing to you, you didn't understand it, and then when it was done, you'd say amen and leave and maybe, maybe not come back the following week. Well, we, we want to do church God's way here. And I believe church should be the most creative place on the planet. Because if you do open your Bible to the very first verse in the very first book, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says we're made in the image of God. Therefore, we believe that the church should in fact be the most creative place on the planet. And we try to do what Jesus did. And Jesus taught with something called parables. And what he would do is he would leverage pop culture to teach sophisticated biblical principles so that everyone could understand. In other words, he would use things like farmers and farms or fish and fishermen so that people of his time could understand what he was talking about so that no one felt left out. And we want to make sure that whether it's your first time in church or you've been in church all of your life, you actually understand what we are talking about and you don't feel left out. That this is for everyone that walks through our doors today. So for the next four weeks, including this week, we're going to be talking about some incredible movies. Next week, you don't want to miss it. Pastor Linda will be preaching and the movie will be Forrest Gump. And yes, everyone that comes will get a box of chocolates. You will, you will get that next week. So come hungry. You're going to get chocolates next week. Now check this out. This is really cool. The following week, I'm really excited. Uh, it looks like uh, the movie, first let me tell you the movie, is Shawshank Redemption, one of my favorite movies. And we are going to shoot part of the message on site where the movie was actually filmed. So it's going to be really, really great. And then the final week, uh, we're going to do Star Wars, which is an all-time classic, a great movie. So you don't want to miss one week of this series. But today, we're going to start with a movie that came out in 1999. How many of you were even alive in 1999? Make noise. Yeah. A movie called Jurassic Park. How many of you actually saw the movie in a theater? Man, it was, it was incredible. And why it was so different is because they used a technology called CGI, computer generated imagery, and it made those monsters look real, didn't it? I mean, when I saw those, I remember seeing, and it still holds up today, in fact. If you look at it, it still looks legit today. And I just remember being there and thought, wow, these monsters are real. I know they're not real, but they seem real. And I want to talk today not about monsters that exist in a movie, I want to talk about monsters that exist in our mind. I want, to, I want to talk about mind monsters today. And they might not seem real to some people, but they seem real to you. And mind monsters are the thoughts that we think and the lies we believe that keep us 
from living our best life. And God wants you to live your best life. So we want to help with that. I personally deal with some of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So we're going to unpack some of these monsters. We're going to talk about them. Tell me if any of you can relate. Let's start with this. How many of you here in the room today, you can relate to the monster called self doubtosaurus Anybody else? self doubtosaurus I deal <laughs> with... Self-doubt. I'm really doubting myself now that I've seen that picture. <laughs> Self-doubt a source. And here's the thing. This monster will attack your confidence. He'll attack your self-esteem and make you feel like you're not enough. And there are people in the room, you've dealt with this, because right now, because of something that's happened to you, something that you've done, or something that someone else has told you, you feel like you're not enough. There are, there are moms in the room, you feel like you're not a good enough mom, and you always doubt yourself. There are people in the room, you're, you're not smart enough, you're not educated enough. There are people in the room, you'll never feel skinny enough, and that's your whole goal, because you're living in this comparison world where you're looking at somebody else's Instagram photos, and you're saying, I don't look like that. Let me give you a little clue. They don't look like that either. <laughs> And we're going to start a new, a new app that you can download here at TE, and it's called InstaSham, because that's what it is, but that's what you do. You, you're, you're not enough. There are people in the room, you don't feel holy enough. You look at your life, and you're like, man, how could God love someone like me? I don't, I don't feel holy enough. I, I don't feel like I'm a good enough spouse. I don't feel like somebody thinks I'm good enough. I'm not good enough at my job. And you just feel under qualified in certain areas of your life. Maybe when you were young, somebody spoke something to you. Uh, maybe when you were young, something happened to you, but as a result of that, still here you are as an adult, and you doubt yourself, and you just think, I'll never be who God called me to be. And if you're not careful, this will eat you alive. And I know this because I deal with self doubtosaurus Before I come out here and preach every week, I go, do I have it this week? Am I qualified? God, have you given me what these people need, our church needs to hear that will help them take a step and get closer to you, Jesus? And I'm just being honest. There are times I go out and go, I don't know, man. I hope I've got the energy. I hope I've got the right word that you need. And I doubt myself. And check this out. This monster, he will prey on a specific thing. And here's what I've learned his favorite food is. Are you ready? He wants to prey on your past. And he will convince you to go up and dig up things that you had already buried. And he will bring your past into your future that will keep you from moving into the present. And he'll, he'll kind of feed on these regrets that you have and these insecurities that you have. And he'll remind you of things that you did or things that someone did to you and convince you that you still need to feel shameful and you still need to feel guilty and you still should be afraid, and it will cause us to be paralyzed and never really move into the life that God wants for us, the monster of self-doubt. Anybody deal with this? I think it's a popular monster today. How about this? The worry mammoth. Anybody today? The worry mammoth. I'm really worried after I've seen that picture of those things coming out of my face. Anyhow, uh, we live in a time where it is popular to worry. It's like if we're not worried, we don't care. So we worry about everything. Oh my gosh, I'm worried about the government. I'm worried about the pandemic. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my family. I'm worried about the future. I'm just worried, worried, worried. You're like freaking out. You lay in bed at night and you just kind of replay the same things over and over in your head. It's 3 a.m. and this is all that you can think about. And then if you're not worried, check out what this monster does. He'll make you feel guilty for not worrying that you should be worried about something. You should not have peace in your life. You better be worried about something or you really don't care like the rest of us. And we, we kind of live in this state of, of worry. And listen, there are people in the room, you break every law except this one, Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong and you believe that for your life. And you're like, man, I'm just in a place, anything could collapse at any minute. This is your mindset. 
You're like, I, I had a good day yesterday, but man, every, everything's about to fall apart. And you, you are worried, worried, worried. You deal with this. You have the monster called the worry mammoth. Now, this is the most popular one recently, I believe. The monster that I call Ofendodon. <laughs> Ofendodon. You offended me, man. You hurt me. How could you think that? How could you say that? Why would you post that? Why did you vote for her? Why did you vote for him? That offends me. This offends me. Everything offends me. I don't know what to do. I'm messed up. And we just walk around so hurt and so offended. And we're just, oh, every, everybody's offending me. That hurt me. The, the reason it's hard for some of you to stay happy is because it's so easy for you to stay offended. And what has happened is there's an enemy, there's a monster that I'm going to go into a little detail about in the future. Uh, but, but that enemy whose motive, watch, is destruction, his method is division, and what he's done is used offense to divide you and people that God had one time put together. Now you are separated because you've allowed offense to come into your heart now watch, this is how smart this monster is. He doesn't do this. He doesn't come announcing himself, hey, I'm about to offend you. You better get ready. He doesn't do that. That's too easy. What he does, watch, he'll use something that was never even intended for you that you pick up, that you plant as this seed in your heart, and now it is growing in toxic soil. It was never intended for you. The thing that they said wasn't about you. It's just what they thought. They didn't intentionally not include you. They just didn't think about you. And now since you didn't get invited to the party, you get, infed, you get offended and now you're walking away from relationships that meant something to you at some point, but this monster has messed you up. And... Listen, I, I thought about this and I prayed about this. And, and for those of you that, that get offended easily, here's what the Lord told me to tell you. That's stupid. Amen. That's stupid. I mean, I, it, it's stupid be, because watch. Offense is an event. Offended yeah. is a decision. Yeah. Let me say that again. Offense is an event. Something happened. Offended is a decision. You chose to be offended. Yeah. You, you made a choice to allow something to get in you that was never meant for you. And here's, here's my advice. In the words of the prophet Snoop Dogg, you just need to drop it like it's hot. Like right now. Just drop it. <laughs> drop it like it's hot. You, you need to let that stuff go. Because I promise you, this monster will mess you up. The monster of offense. The Bible has something to say about offense. If you were here last week, I talked about if you want a, a different life, you got to do different things. Watch what it says in Proverbs 19.11. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to what? Overlook an offense. Overlook an offense. Be very careful of the monster that I call offend of dawn. How about this one? Tyrannosaurus stress. Whoa. We are all stressing out, aren't we? I'm telling you, man, stress, everybody say this, stress can mess you up. Stress can mess you up. It can physically mess you up. There are studies that are out there that talks about the negative effects of stress on your body. And it will mess you up. And so many of us right now, this is our most popular pastime, stressing out. Oh, my gosh. Anxiety. I've got anxiety. Everything's freaking me out. We're, every, I can't do anything. I'm stressing about my kids in school. I'm, I'm stressing about my, my bank account. I'm stressing about my marriage. I'm stressing about the government. I'm stressing about what I see on the news. By the way, you can't believe everything you see on the news. That's just a side note. Just side note. But I'm stressing. Oh my gosh, I'm stressing. How, how many of you are, are stressed because of the person that's sitting beside you today? Just put your hand up. No, that's a joke. 
don't do that. Your ride home is going to be really, really bad. Don't, 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 don't do that. Now, there are some people and you're like, hey, pastor, man, I'm not stressed. It's all good in the hood, man. <laughs> pastor, I'm, I, I don't get stressed, pastor, dude. That's because you're smoking pot. <laughs> listen, God, listen, Jesus didn't bleed so you could smoke weed. Somebody tweet that. <laughs> People say, well, wait, pastor, man. It grows. It's nature. God made it. I can smoke it. Well, God made poison ivy. Try rolling that smoke and see how that works. I'm just saying. Some of y'all come in next week itching the inside of your mouth, scratching. I'm just, just trying to help you today. We all stress about different things. But, but here's what we do at our church. It's one thing to talk about a problem. Come on, we want to talk about a solution. I don't want you to leave stressed, worried, offended. I don't, I, none of those things. So in the time that we have left, I want to give you a few handles that will help you if, listen, this is the key thing, if you apply these to your life. God's word is real. It's powerful. But if you don't do anything with it and just leave here and, and say, when Tuesday hits, you go, well, uh, I know what I heard but you're just gonna fall back into the same old pattern, nothing's gonna change in your life. But if you wanna change the pattern, God can fulfill his purpose. I said, somebody help me. If you wanna change the pattern, God can fulfill his purpose in your life. Change the pattern. Here's the first thing, if you're taking notes, write this down. Write this down. When it comes to fighting these monsters, number one, you need to understand who it is and what it wants. And you need to be able to call it out. And what that means is you need to be able to look in the mirror and go, I struggle with porn. That's your monster. You need to be able to look in the mirror and say, I struggle with unforgiveness. I'm just carrying around. You need to be honest. I struggle with greed. I struggle with addiction. I fooled most of the people, but I know me. And God, you know me. So I'm just now coming to terms or grips with what, God, you already know, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it because God can't heal what you won't reveal. So you're, you're going you're to start talking about it and not be afraid of it. So even right now as we sit here in this room, what's your monster? What's your monster? Envy? Self-doubt? Jealousy, what, what's, what's your monster? Because we all have them. You need to be able to call it out. But whatever that is, whatever that monster is, you need to know that that is really just a subtitle of a larger monster that I want to talk about. The Greek word is diablos, translated devil. Purpose, adversary. In the Hebrew, same thing. Translated, Satan. Same purpose, adversary. That we have a monster, and he doesn't have a long tail in a pitchfork, but he is as real as you and me. And just because you don't believe it doesn't mean that it's not true. And it's important that you understand what we are up against. Now, let me say this. The devil is not God's enemy, because God already won that battle. The devil is not God's adversary. That battle has already been completed. That battle is already finished, it's won. God does not fret about the devil. But it does say in Romans 8, 7, that our adversary, Satan, God's adversary, carnal mind. What's that mean? It means that we struggle against Satan and God struggles with our thinking. Now stay with me. This is why the enemy will always come at your mind because if he can keep you thinking the wrong way, you will always be at odds with God. That's why he will always get in your head because if you have stinking thinking, man, you're never going to be able 
to, to get your head right, and that's what God battles with, your mind. So we want to get our mind right. That's so important that we start thinking differently so that we can begin to act differently. So I'm going to give you something here in a second, really important that you take notes and write this down. So let's look at the solution to keep the enemy out of, out of our head so that we win the battle. Sound good? Here we go. Look at James 4, 7. It says this, submit yourselves then to God, first part, second part, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Here's what I want to give you. Here's what the Lord showed me this week. I want to give you PT's, Pastor Tim's 5S strategy for success in subduing Satan. And that's none of the S's. I'm just getting warmed up. So Pastor Tim's PT's 5S strategy for success in subduing Satan. Satan. Here they are, and then we're going to break it down. You ready? Stop, surrender, submit, search, shift. One more time. Yeah. Stop, surrender, submit, search, shift. What am I talking about? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to stop thinking the way you've been thinking. You're going to get out of that pattern. Some of you, you've had a negative mindset for so long, and your head has been a certain place for so long since you were a kid, and it's just a dangerous place to be, and you need to get out of that, that way of thinking. So you're going to stop that, and what are you going to do? You're going to surrender it to God. You're going to say, God, I can't carry this anymore. This is far too heavy, so watch. God, I'm going to put you over that thing that was over me. That fear, that worry, that self-doubt, that addiction. God, I'm going to surrender that to you, and I'm going to put you over that thing that's been over me, and that's what submission is. You are submitting this thing and your life to the authority of God. So you're putting God in the place where that thing, that monster used to be. God is now over that, and what are you going to do? This means you submit to his truth, which is his word. So let's just say you're here and you struggle with worry. What are we going to do? Now we're going to search what God has to say about worry, and that's going to be our truth. So instead of us freaking out, we're going to go, wait, I'm going to stop. I'm going to surrender. I'm going to submit to God's truth. Now I'm going to search, and this is really easy. Here's all you do. Let's just say you're worrying. You don't have to know the whole Bible. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to pull out your phone, you're going to go to Google, and you're going to say, what does the Bible have to say about worry? And it might say something like this, found in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, here's the option, pray about everything. So when you search, this is what you'll find. Now, this is so important. Now, that's your new truth because, listen, if you're going to pray, don't worry, and if you're going to worry, don't pray because it'll just cancel the other one out. So what are you going to do? Here's my new truth. Now, as a result of what I've just heard, I'm going to shift. I'm going in a different direction. You know what that is? Repentance. The the word repent means I'm going in a new direction. I'm thinking in a different way. So you're going to stop. You're going to surrender. You're going to submit. You're going to search. And you are going to shift. Come on. Is that helping anybody today? And you need to apply this. When this happens, man, you need to apply this to your life. So that's the first part. Submit yourselves then to God. We're going to get under the authority of God. Then watch. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is an ongoing thing. Prior to pastoring, I was in sales for a long time. And I was really successful because I had something called the five no rule. In other words, I would keep asking you to buy it until you told me no five times. And after that, then I would move on to the next person. So let let me give you some clarity in what this looks like uh, regarding how to deal with the enemy. So I'm going to ask Pastor Linda to come up on stage. Come on up, honey, real quick. Give it up for PL. How you doing, honey? All right. Let's go. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pretend that I am a shoe salesman. I simply say this because if you saw the amount of shoes in our house, that you would know that Pastor Linda needs delivered from the demon of shoes. So anyhow, 
So I'm trying to help her with that. I'm just kidding. So I, no, what, no matter what I tell you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to just say no. Okay, we're, we're going to say no. Yes. So, okay, I'm a salesman. So here we go. You ready? I'm, I, I come in. This is my, like, I got my thing going on. I didn't walk like that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a point. I didn't, I didn't really do this, but you got to have some swagger. Sales swagger, I call it. So I'm walking in. Man, you would look great in a new pair of shoes. Can I, can I help you with a new pair of shoes? No. No. What if I told you these shoes were your favorite color? No. What if I told you these shoes would make your feet smell better? I don't know. <laughs> no. no. What if I told you that these shoes would make you want the salesman? <laughs> It's a stretch. It's a stretch. No, no really? No. What, what, if, what if I said the, these shoes uh, were made for walking and that's just what they'll do in one of these days? <laughs> these shoes are going to walk all over you. you. I would have to say no. You would say no. no. So at that point, I go, she's not buying what I'm selling. And what I'm telling you, there will be a point when you keep telling the devil no and you're not buying what he's selling. No, you can't have my marriage. 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 No, you can't have my sobriety. No, you can't have my sobriety. No, you can't have my, no, you can't have my kids. No, you can't have my kids. They belong to me. God's entrusted them with me. You can't have my kids. You can't have my mind. You can't have my... Somebody, come on, somebody help me. You got to just keep telling the enemy, no, resist the devil. And that just doesn't mean one time. That means over and over and over again. And at some point, he's going to walk away from you in that area. It doesn't mean that he won't come in another area, but he will walk away in that area if you are consistent in telling him no. Just keep telling him no. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, finally, be strong in the Lord in his mighty power, not our mighty power, because we're not powerful enough. But with him, we can do all things through him that empowers us. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Everyone say, take your stand. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. Listen, we've been knocked down enough. Come on, it's time to take a stand, church. It is time to take a stand. Look at Judges 6.12. This is such a great scripture. It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, to give you context, it's interesting because the person that he was talking to really had low self-confidence and didn't believe in himself. And he actually called himself the least of these. And, and God steps in and said, no, 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 watch. The Lord is with you, and because the Lord is with you, you're, you're no longer the least of these. You are now a mighty warrior. Here's my second point. Listen, if you want to beat the monsters, stop thinking like a victim and start acting like a warrior. Stop thinking like a victim. Poor, poor me. Everybody's against me. Everything's bad in my life. And what you do, watch. One of the biggest mistakes we do is we feed the wrong thing. We feed the monsters that are against us instead of the power that is in us. And somebody hear me right now, listen. Whatever that thing is that's coming against you, if you want it to die, stop feeding it. Stop feeding it. We're feeding it the wrong thing. We're, we're speaking over our lives and over our situation and posting all of this garbage that, that has no business being posted from children of God. I mean, can, can I just talk to you for a minute? Can we, just, can we just talk? Posting things like this, talking like this, I'll never change. It's always going to be this way. This is how it's been since I was a kid. This is how it is now. This is how my marriage is going to be. This is how my kids are. This is how my family is. I'm, I'm never going to have any money. I'm never going to have the right job. I'm always going to be this way. I'm always going to be this way. You need to be really careful because what your mind thinks, your body hears. 
And what, watch, and what your mouth says, your spirit receives. So when you're talking all of this stuff, I'm just saying you're feeding the wrong thing. And people do this, and, and I've seen this on Facebook. Pray for me, my life is falling apart. How about this shift? Pray for me because my life was falling apart, but God's putting me back together. God is, God is making me new. God is, God is doing a new thing for me. Pray for me because I used to be going in this direction, but now I'm going in this direction. I'm not turning around. I'm not going the other way. You can pray for me because God is doing a new thing in me. Pray for me because I decided I'm going to get clean. I'm going to get sober. That's not my monster anymore. Pray for me. You got to shift your thinking. You got to shift the language that you speak because if you keep saying the wrong thing, your life will keep going in the wrong way because your life follows the words that you speak. Now watch, stay with me. I want to teach you this. Look what it says in Romans 10, 17. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you are speaking, you are doing something to yourself regarding your faith because you're hearing what you're saying. When, when you're speaking, when words are going out into the atmosphere, not only is the person that you're talking to hearing them, you are hearing them, and they are either growing your faith or they are taking you away from God because faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let, let me ask you a question. What are you saying to yourself? What are you talking about? What are you posting about on social media? I think the best thing for some people that, that you could do to see your life turned around is just don't post anything on Facebook for a week. And Oh, it got quiet in here now. Oh, I know, y'all. I, that's, that's worse than taking heroin away from an addict. Oh, no, I need my Facebook. Let me tell you what you need. You need the word of God as an absolute truth in your life. I love Facebook. Don't get me wrong, man. I do it. I love it. But you're not going to see me belly aching on Facebook. And if you do, somebody call me out. I'm not going to go, oh, I preached and nobody came to the Lord. Pastor Eeyore, here he is. <laughs> I preached and nobody stood up and shouted. Sometimes I'm going to shout for myself, y'all. I'm going to encourage myself. And you need to do the same thing. Just be really careful. Look what it says in Micah 7, 8. I love this text. It says, talking to his enemies, he says, don't gloat over me. Watch. For though I fall, I will rise again. Yeah. What's he saying? This was bad. I fell. Now watch. He said, I fell. How many of you have ever fallen? Come on. How many of you have ever made a mistake? If your hand's not up, Jesus, I'm so glad you decided to join us today. We've all jacked up, man. We've all jacked it up. We, we've all fallen. But here's the difference. Watch. I didn't lay down for the 930. I'm giving you all this. Look, it would be so easy just to lay down. Oh, I fell. Poor, poor me. No, you know what you're saying? I fell. But though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again. Keep getting up. Keep getting up. It's not too late. It's not too late for you to turn it around, to have a different life. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. The Lord will be my light. I, I just need to pause it. I don't know how many first-time guests we have here, and already you go, yeah, this ain't grandma's church. I get it. I get it. I, I just want to speak into this because you might be hearing your, your whole idea of church is one thing and you're like, these people are crazy and they're, like, they're smoking weed. I don't know what's going on with this church. Uh, and they're so excited and they're standing up. Here's what I want to say. Before you judge them, you don't know what God did in their life. And I'm just saying it's okay to be excited. It's okay to be passionate. In church, our church, the culture of our church is we want to have a church where you don't have to go, that you actually want to go. Like it's Sunday, I get to be at TE Church. That, that's what we want here. So, and you know, it would be one thing, I would just close with this, be one thing if Jesus was still in the grave, we could all sit here on our hands because that would suck. 
<laughs> How's that? Don't tweet that. My pastor just said that would suck if Jesus was in the grave. But let me tell you, we serve a God that's alive. We, we serve a God that, that is out of the grave, and that does change everything. So, all right. Here, here's the last thing. I want, to, I want to show you this. Take a look at this. Here's a clip from Jurassic Park that we're going to talk about when it comes to, to fighting our enemies. Take a look. Here's what I want you to get from that. There will be a time that the enemy is going to come knocking at your door. There will be a time that the enemy is knocking at your door. Here's the last point. We're almost done. When the enemy comes knocking on your door, you start knocking on God's door. You, you start knocking on God. Let me put it this way. When the enemy comes to prey on you, you need to pray to him. And you need to knock on his door because here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7 7 he said keep asking and it will be given to you keep searching and you will find it watch keep knocking and the door will be opened for you listen if you shut the door on the enemy watch God start to open up doors for you you just need to shut the door on the enemy and watch what God will do for you so what what's what's your what's your battle what what's what's the monster what, what's that thing that's happening in your mind that, that's too, too much for you? Maybe it's stress. Maybe it's anxiety. I don't know what it is, but I know we all, all have monsters. And here's one of the greatest monsters that some of you uh, face. And it's the monster that tells you that no matter what you do, that God isn't going to love you because you see yourself as unlovable. Because you know you. Let's face it, you know what you did, you know what you thought, you know the mistakes that you've made, you know the regrets that you have, you know the choices that you, you kind of decided to do that now you look back and you're like, man, if I only had a, an eraser for my life, I'd just erase all of that. If I could only ha have gone back and, and not, not had that abortion, if only I wouldn't have started this addiction. If only I wouldn't have stepped out of my marriage into adultery. But let me tell you, that was then. This is now. And there is nothing, look at me now, look at me. There's nothing that you've done. I need you to hear me today. There's nothing that you've done that can keep God from coming to you today, scooping you up and holding you close and loving you like you've never been loved before, if you just invite him in. Because look what the text says. Matthew 7, 8, it says, for everyone, everyone's you. Everyone is that person right now that thought God could never love you. Everyone. Everyone is that person that, that did that unspeakable thing or had that unspeakable thing happen to them. And right now, we're going to put God's word over the enemy's lies. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who what? Knocks, the door will be open. Here's all you have to do today. You have to knock. You have to say, God, 
man, I, I just, I want it to change. God, I, I'm knocking on your door. And when you knock, he answers. I'm believing today that God's about to show up in your life. Some of you, you've never experienced this yet. God's, God's about to become very real to you. And God's about to show up in your life because you're about to knock and you're about to meet Jesus for the first time. Let's pray. I'd ask that you bow your heads. Just close your eyes. Father, thank you today. Thank you for the creativity of our teams. God, thank you that we can have an atmosphere in this church where we actually can have fun and laugh, but Jesus, you are present. And your spirit is present speaking to us right now. So I'm gonna ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I want you to, just in your mind, just identify what's that monster. For some of you, it's not just one, there's a lot going on. What's that thing? And then here's what I'm gonna have you do. Instead of knocking, what we're gonna do, in just a moment, I'm gonna count to three, and if you wanna knock on that door, you're just gonna slip your hand up in the air. And you're gonna say, Jesus, I need you in this area of my life. I can't forgive, I can't move on, I can't beat this battle. I, I feel like I'm just stuck. And we believe in our church that in that holy moment, that heaven opens up, and as you're reaching up, God's reaching down, God's gonna touch you, and things can begin to change. But you have a role to play in your miracle. You need to change the pattern, you need to shift. But if you want that to happen, it can happen today. And we saw people at the first service just saying yes to God, knocking on that door. I believe there are, there are so many people, hundreds of people in this room right now that are gonna say yes to God. You're gonna knock on that door and God's gonna come. This is a holy moment. This isn't for you and the person beside you. Don't, don't be embarrassed, man. This is what this is all about. This is about life change. So on the count of three, if that's you, I want you to slip your hand up in the air. One, two, three, slip your hand up. Wow. Just hands up all over the room right now. So many hands. Just put your hand up. Yeah. All over the room. All over the room. Father, you see our hands lifted, God. And when we're doing this, we're saying, God, I surrender. I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes to fix this. So, Jesus, I need you. So, Father, we thank you that, that even right now in this moment, you're already at work. And we're going to apply these biblical principles to our life so that we can see things turn around. And God, that we would never be the same as a, as a result of an encounter that we've had with you in this holy space today. So Father, we love you. We trust you. We, we thank you, God, that we do get to celebrate you, God, that, that we get to laugh and we get to, to have fun here, God, but we also get to have our life changed here. And that all happens because the tomb is empty and that means that the best is yet to come. Come on, if you receive it. Come on, I said, if you receive it today. Awesome. God bless you guys.